This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending April 9th. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manus Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of Siri Finance. And joining us this week is Darren King, Head of CMBS at TREP. Welcome, Darren. Thanks for having me. This week, the U.S. leads the world in total vaccines administered, and that translates into 20% of the population now vaccinated. And President Biden unveiled his plan to overhaul the corporate tax code. And bullish economic signs early this week, the services industry surged to a record high last month on the heels of strong job growth in March. And consumer borrowing surged in February, but this week's initial unemployment claims were a disappointing miss. And questions persist about big bank ties to the Archegos collapse. And in New York City, the approved budget is headed to the governor's desk for signature and that would create the highest combined local tax rate in the country. It's a market that doesn't seem to have a lot of conviction right now, even though we have a lot going for us. Uh, we saw a really big jobs number on Friday, one that really surprised a lot of the market watchers. At 916,000 new jobs, it was about 40% higher over consensus estimates from Barron's and Bloomberg. Uh, there were some whisper numbers that the number could be as high as a million or more. We didn't get that high, but anybody will take 916,000 jobs. Interest rates fell this week, right? We were kind of in that 175, 10 year a week or so ago. Now we're more like 165, which is a positive for the market. Before we saw the jobs number on Friday, we had a very good uh, ADP report. So the economic numbers are pointing in the in the upward direction, but all week long we treaded water, right? The markets were really kind of spinning their wheels, not a lot of conviction. We didn't rally tremendously on any of the positive economic numbers uh, after the jobs number itself. And, and I wonder if part of that is, you know, we've just so front run this recovery story that, you know, all the positive impacts of, of coming out of COVID are already, you know, baked into the numbers we see, where perhaps some of this lack of conviction is the lack of visibility we have on what the ultimate high point will be on taxation, right? We're talking about a 20, 28% corporate tax rate with potentially some floors and other things. So, you know, the market really never seemed to get its footing this week, even though the economic signals were generally positive. I, I've been talking about it pre-show, but I read Jamie Dimon's uh, letter to shareholders, which was like almost war and peace level uh, length, I would say. Uh, but he, there were some there were some interesting takes in there, uh, including the concept that coming out of the Great Recession or the GFC or whatever you want to call it, the quantitative easing that was happening at that point was coming into a market that was locked up with no liquidity, and there was less in the way of fiscal stimulus. Now coming out of this, you know, pandemic-induced recession, the QE is coming into a market awash in liquidity, and we have several trillion dollars worth of fiscal stimulus. And he says, as long as the Fed doesn't come in and, and tamp things down by raising interest rates, and as long as inflation doesn't get out of control, which are two big ifs, right? He was, what is he saying? A Goldilocks economy in 2023, uh, which could be not too hot, not too cold, but, but incredible growth. Talking about the lack of conviction that I, they started off with, you know, on the same day, the Fed minutes came out, which underscored what we already knew, which was no interest rate hikes and no tapering of the bond purchases for the foreseeable future. And Jamie Dimon coming out and basically saying the next two years, you know, equity should go up, the economy should get stronger and so forth. And yet it was a collective yawn. And what that tells me is that people are kind of looking for an excuse to hold on to cash, to keep uh, some powder dry, and, and that maybe the next move is a southerly one. Is there an element of this, which is uh, the world is slightly more open than it was a couple of months ago? So when stimulus checks hit, they didn't hit Robinhood accounts. They hit, they were, uh, you know, pre-booking vacations or, you know, taking the trip down to Florida or whatever it may be. I mean, I just feel like maybe the, the, the reopening and summer and everything else has a few fewer people sitting at their desk trading options. I know that 
Robinhood bros trading options don't really move whole markets, but overall there is a concept of like people are putting their money elsewhere and not just throwing everything into stocks right now. Turning to CRE CLOs, Darren, we saw demand for CRE CLOs spike this past quarter. Walk us through the performance for Q1. Speaking of Goldilocks. You know, first quarter produced issuance results unlike we've ever seen in the CMBS market. The series CLO space issued $9 billion in total compared to a $6 billion number for the conduit CMBS space. That relationship has never occurred before. Series CLOs have never beaten conduits for a quarter, any quarter. Um, so this is something that, you know, just sort of sets the market apart and, and sort of begs some questions as to how and why this all occurred. Before we get into a little bit of that, taking a step back and kind of comparing this to where we are, this $9 billion that was done in Series CLOs compares to a total of you know, about 8.7 billion for all of 2020 and year over year, you know, quarterly number that averages around $3 billion. So you're looking at three times, you know, the amount we've seen since 2017. And, you know, almost, we're almost halfway to the record number for, for CLO issuance, which was about 19 billion in, in 2019. So you've got a really interesting scenario developing within this market, which brings us kind of back to why is this happening? Um, and I think a, a big part of it is related to, you know, borrowers don't want to lock in long-term financing. You know, the CMBS conduit market is generally a 10-year market where for nine and a half of those years, your loan as a borrower is locked out. You can't prepay it. So if you borrow money today, you've got that same loan for the next nine and a half years. When you come to the series CLO market or to, to you know, these debt funds that don't issue straight into the CMBS conduit market, the loans provide a lot more flexibility. You can borrow money on a three to five year basis, but it's pretty much prepay at any time you want after the first 12 months. So we're looking at an environment today with still uncertainty and lenders are more conservative in their approach, lending at you know, 60 LTV or 55 LTV today, whereas you know, in 2019, that may have been 70 or 75 LTV. As a borrower, do you really want to lock in that lower number? If you think a year from now, you may be back to that 70 LTV point. And so I think it's really driving property owners toward this shorter term, more flexible financing and away from the conduit market. This is very interesting to me uh, on two levels. The first one being to your point, right? If you have a guy who has a $100 million property kind of in theory, and you know he was expecting a year ago to be able to refinance and get a $70 million loan, and, and today he's only able to get a $50 million loan, right? So he's saying, if I wait a year, if I use this transitional source of funding a year from now, maybe I can come back and still get that $70 million long-term debt and, and get more proceeds out of that. I, I get that part of it. That's, you know, they're kind of, you know, weighing the possibility that we'll get higher proceeds down the line. But what, what they're telling me too, is that these developers are not believing that interest rates are going from a 175 treasury today to a three and a half treasury in a year or two. Because if they thought that was the case, that $100 million property is not a $100 million property anymore, right? So, you know, when I hear you talking about this, to me, it's saying that the developers are making the bet that they're gonna see a, a reflation, if you will, uh, or a loosening of liquidity standards by long-term uh, CMBS lenders without the risk of a, a real high 10-year treasury rate. Yeah, I think that's a great point. To add to that, I think one of the elements is that they're comfortable stomaching small moves in interest rates. You ask most you know, developers, property owners, they'll tell you they'll trade a, higher, a slightly higher interest rate for more proceeds. The commercial real estate market has built an entire mezzanine and subordinate debt. Billions upon billions of dollars of that debt has been built on exactly that trade, which is a borrower saying, I'll take more I'll take more money and pay you a pretty high interest rate for it because you know proceeds is a win for me. But one of the other interesting parts of this dynamic is, you know, there's I think a little bit of an expectation to see a reCLO space that you know these are more transitional loans by nature. Maybe this is where these hotel and retail loans that the conduit market won't write um, wound up. And that actually couldn't be further from the truth. If you actually look at the data from the first quarter, the combined hotel and retail numbers only totaled about 5% of the collateral balance. So these series CLOs are still heavily focused on multifamily, which was more than half of the collateral, and then office. Now those two combined property types make up over 80%. 
And as we mentioned before, in the traditional conduit space, you're seeing only drips and drabs of retail and hotel as well. So in neither the, you know, the 10 year fixed area or this transitional capital can hotels get any financing. And on the retail side, it would seem only really like the grocery anchored Home Depot, that type of thing, which is really getting, you know, capital right now. One element is that most of the originators in this space were, or a lot of the originators in this space were hurt pretty badly by uh, the big drop in CMBS prices early 2020. I think they've all kind of fortified their balance sheets and gotten their their lines of credit in order and gotten a lot more capital ready to go out the door. They've all come out with pretty ambitious lending targets for 2021, and they're going to be feeding this pipeline. But is there an element of this on the demand side, which is that in a rising rate environment, in an you know unsure future environment, there is likely more demand for short-term floating rate paper like this? You know, I, I think that's a, it's a good question. Um, I think historically the series CLO market has been, the issuance has been driven by the issuers themselves and right. kind of counting on the demand um, from the buyer base to be there. I don't think they can necessarily turn the spigot on and off realizing that there's you know, huge investor appetite for AAA series CLOs. I don't know if they have that, that level of control um, over their issuance pipeline. What does factor into that that occurred is what you saw just based on the pricing levels in the market on the CMB, on the series CLO bonds that were issued is a larger bucket of what's called a ramp up period, a ramp up bucket. And what that is, is it's essentially a portion of the series CLO that's cash just sitting there. It hasn't been allocated to any loans yet. And this is a common occurrence. It's been done for you know years within this market. It's not a new construct in the pandemic, but it is a bigger percentage, it made up about 9% of the 9 billion. Um, so, you know, about $800 million in capital from these issuers saying, I don't have a loan today, but the pricing levels, you know, are pretty good in the market right now for me to sell bonds into the market. So I'll actually fund the liability without actually having a loan, but I'll, I know I'll find the loan because, you know, the demand is there from on the borrower side as well. So they are taking advantage of the bond investor appetite but not necessarily able to do it directly as, okay, well, let's just go issue right now. Is it clear to the bond buying community, you know, what percentage of each deal is, you know, quasi stabilized, right? In the past, you know, in 2019, 2018, things that were going in that were really transitional, right? You're replacing a tenant, you were, you're renovating, you know, part of the property or something like that. And you were counting on, you know, debt service coverage ratio growing over time. And as a, an investor, you kind of knew what the risks were, right? That these were not the same kind of credits that we were getting on the CMBS private label side per se. But now it sounds like a big percentage of these things are CMBS light, right? There is no transition. There is no move to stabilization for big portions of this. Is the pricing reflected in this? Are, are, are spreads coming in and are people recognizing that this may not as be as risky as it was two years ago in terms of, you know, taking a chance on a developer's business model? Uh, the pricing has come in based on the pandemic. So I think similar to the conduit traditional CMBS space, um, where that pricing has recovered to really levels at where it was pre-pandemic, the series CLO space has done the same. So AAAs are, uh, which are the bulk of the deal, are back to levels they were pre-pandemic. I don't think they're necessarily representative of a an overall tighter spread level because the collateral makeup is a little bit different, um, but you've got a lot of pull, you know, pushes and pulls in that, right? LIBOR is now at zero effectively, whereas you go back two years and it actually had a real yield to it. So there's a different yield profile to the asset too that also kind of plays into where that spread will fall out. I mean, my thing with all of this is, you know, whenever anybody writes a loan, they're underwriting it, assuming everyone's acting rationally and morally, which I think 99% of the world does, they're underwriting a story in these cases, right? It's the story that this developer or borrower is going to be able to release up an 80% occupied office or a multifamily owner is going to be able to rehab 20% of the units and increase rents by a hundred bucks a month or whatever it is. I think, and there are a lot of, um, you know, interest reserves and things built into these loans that are, you know, pretty beneficial to the bondholder. There's also the element of uh, the issuer backing up the deals, right? So buying out loans that maybe aren't performing as well as they should, basically supporting the deals in the market. However, having said all of that good stuff, it's gotta be a very interesting time to be underwriting transitional loans 
when we have no idea what we're transitioning to, right? Or maybe we, we're we assuming that we're transitioning, quote unquote, back to normal, but God knows what that even means at this point. So I've actually spoken to a couple of lenders in this space, and it's it's interesting because some of them will actually say it's easier to write the transitional loan right now than it is to write the stabilized conduit loan. For one, when you write a stabilized conduit loan, you don't generally get a business plan. You don't generally have an operator. They're they're 95% occupied and their goal is to stay that way. When you get these transitional loans, you typically have borrowers, property owners who have done this before. So they've got a history of, of taking 70% occupied multifamily and, and turning it into 90% occupied. And they've got a business plan and they're used to, you know, executing on that. So it's actually in some instances easier now because even, you know, coming you know, with the pandemic and all the uncertainty surrounding it, you've got sort of an underwriting point that's still more conservative because you're, you're not underwriting to 90% occupied, you're underwriting to 70. Now, certainly that can go to 50, um, you know, that can happen, but you've also got a borrower with more experience about turning around a property as opposed to a sponsor that's, you know, used to being in a stabilized world, used to being, used to having stabilized properties. And now the pandemic has sort of unseated that. And so if they, you know, lose a couple of big tenants, you know, they don't know what to do. You know, they're, they're now scrambling to formulate a business plan to resurrect their property. Yeah, this is, this is totally kind of out there, but it must tell us a little bit about kind of bank warehouse lender risk appetite at this point and interest rates that they're charging because if they were charging lower, like basically these guys are using the CLO as a form of financing their balance sheet. Like they're not really conduit lenders who are just, you know, factories that are originating loans to sell and making money on the arbitrage. So it must tell you that the big banks are maybe have increased their rates at this point. So yeah, I think it's a combination of uh, increasing their rates because obviously not so much in the uh, warehouse lending space for loans, but we saw it, you know, a year ago at this time in the CMBS QCIP warehousing, just the damage that was caused um, when margin calls hit. But the other aspect, not just raising rates, but if they're providing less leverage, right. you can go get more leverage through the CRE CLO vehicle than you can from your, you know, your bank warehouse. The, the you know, these debt funds are going to run as right. fast as they can into, into their permanent issuance through this, you know, through the securitized space. We talked about multifamily last week, and we have an update on that analysis looking at occupancy. And thanks, Martha. We were talking about this a little bit last week. We teased it up in last week's podcast. We were kind of halfway through our analysis. Now we're at the point where we've, we've largely finished it. And, and what we're finding is quite interesting. Maybe not that surprising, but uh, it does kind of underscore something that we, we thought was the case throughout 2020. And that is this, that the big cities and, and certain other areas as well have really kind of underperformed the broader market when it comes to occupancy. And that does make sense. Big cities, big loans, big loans, big uh, expense, which means big rents. And accordingly, you know, people that pay a lot of money are the first ones to, to vacate when, uh, you know, when their job goes work from home um, full time. So we looked at about 22,000 loans uh, and properties spanning both the CMBS private label market and Freddie Mac data. We looked at about 3,500 different towns and cities. And overall, what we found was on a loan count basis, about 4.8% of all multifamily loans now have occupancy of less than 80%. So, you know, that's, that's about a point or two up from what it had been in 2019. So there had been some softening, but that's not really the, the story per se, right? We, we expected some level of occupancy decline uh, due to COVID. The real story is this, that you see big areas where there are no properties with less than 80% occupancy in 2020, and then other areas that are just kind of getting crushed. So... Among the top 100 cities by representation, meaning they had the, the highest number of uh, CMBS loans in the multifamily space, here are some examples of places that had no loans, 0% with occupancy at the underlying property of less than 80%. Phoenix, Orlando, Minneapolis, Omaha, Tacoma, Knoxville, Tempe, Glendale, Anaheim, interestingly, Fort Lauderdale, 
West Palm Beach, all of those places, you know, we, we call among them winners that, you know, either their properties are inexpensive enough that people say, well, we may as well stay here, or they're people that that's where they live, right? It's not like it's, it's millennials who say, I'm going to spend three years living in Manhattan and then go raise a family out in the suburbs or something like that. It's where they expect to live their life uh, going forward. So there are some big winners, you know, a couple of other winners that have small percentages, uh, Charlotte under 1%, Jersey City, New Jersey, also under 1%. But then you look at the other end of the scale, there are cities where the percentage is more than twice the national average. So among the top 100 cities by representation, look at this, Boston, 28% by count of all CMBS loans have an, a less than 80% occupancy at the underlying collateral. Santa Monica, 23%. Tallahassee, Florida, um, College Town, maybe that has something to do with it, 15%. San Francisco, 14.6%. Uh, Seattle, 11%. Kansas City, almost 10%. But then I'll throw one more statistic at you and then I'll, I'll uh, open it up to uh, Joe and Darren. If you look at some of these kind of not quite urban areas, but kind of close to the urban core, the numbers are extraordinary. Long Island City, which we've talked about before in this podcast, 50% of their loans. If we had done this by balance weighted, it would have been even higher because these loans are big loans, hundreds of millions of dollars with thousands of units. Uh, Brookline Mass, 48%. Cambridge Mass, 37%. Uh, Sterling Heights, Michigan, 24%. So great differentiation from uh, city to city, town to town. And I think that, you know, if you're an operator and you're under 80% in some of these areas that are really doing quite well, you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with my property? And, you know, if you're in one of these really hard hit areas and, and you're still keeping your head above water, you probably have great management in place, number one. And number two is you got to probably do everything in your power to make sure you're not one of these guys that is, uh, you know, funneling down the drain in the next six months. Yeah, I think, you know, the overall number, man, as you said, it's like 4.8%, I think, which is similar by count and by balance, but it doesn't sound that bad, right? But I think the whole point of this is that, you know, multifamily is not as bulletproof as everyone thinks it is, or at least it's not bulletproof in certain areas. And some of the areas like are not surprising at all, but there are some others that kind of pop up at the top of the list, which you kind of look at, give it a funny face when you see it and be like, there's, there must be something going on there that we don't understand. But I'd say the, the majority of the ones towards the top of the list are urban cores with big lockdowns, right? So, and like you said, the people that have the money that live in the more expensive places also have the money to go live in the Hamptons or live upstate or to live, you know, uh, an hour or two away from the city and work from home. Part of this is Freddie Mac data, right? So we didn't look at Fannie. Maybe we can look at that as well uh, in the future. But so it's interesting because it's a different story with Freddie Mac borrowers as opposed to private label CMBS, I think. I think Freddie probably has some more latitude to work with the borrowers and also has uh, the FHFA kind of looking down on them and telling them to avoid foreclosure if they can, right? They did the 90-day forbearance at the beginning of this thing. They, they got... You know, they continue to do a lot of different programs. I, you know, I don't know. Darren, you live in the city. You live in Manhattan. So I don't know. Give us give us the vibe check. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, Manus's number on Long Island City is mind-blowing, but yet not surprising. You know, I kind of look at like that area as sort of that urban adjacent, always marketed as, you know, the family-friendly way of, of, you know, living in urban New York City, and it's probably sim probably similar areas and other surrounding other you know urban cores, you know, across the United States, and and those are people right. If you've got you know spouse, two point two kids, and a dog, you definitely are the person who's abandoning that location, especially when you don't have to commute to work at all anymore. Uh, you're just commuting to your office, which is adjacent to your bedroom, and taking on you know a much more suburban lifestyle. Just seems to make a lot of sense. You know, anecdotally, I. Just scroll through Street Easy to pass the time here in New York City, always seeing if I can get a better deal somewhere, even though I've got a lease. And the rent concessions are out of control in some of these properties. Now you look in areas of Manhattan, certainly among sort of high-end 
you know, multifamily rentals, you'll see 12, you know, 12 month lease, three months free and a thousand dollar, you know, moving expense tacked on as well. Like that's crazy. You know, I don't know how to, how to reconcile, you know, those kind of numbers you know, in, in this market that, you know, landlords are, are so desperate to, I guess, keep the sticker rate high that they're giving away a quarter of the lease in, you know, in concessions. They want that, that gross potential rent number at the top line to stay very high, I guess. Uh, yeah, this is, this kind of actually links into a couple of other things that we've done over the last, you know, six or nine months on the advisory side. And I've plugged this a few times, so uh, pardon me for plugging it again, but it's worthwhile, I think. We've done a bunch of uh, market-level analyses for different clients of ours, trying to give them a sense of where values have gone, right? So in, in a market where there's a lot less in the way of transactions, these are the types of numbers that you can look at to try and get a sense of where value is going at a high level. We've done it kind of at a market and property type level. We've also done it at kind of the property level itself. So we'll have a couple clients come and say, Hey, we, you know, we own a large mall in this area, or, you know, we lent on a large multifamily in this area and we just need to get a sense of, uh, you know, what our risk exposure is. So that's a, a little shout out to our boy, Lonnie down in Texas, who runs that advisory group, who actually we've, we have some new joiners lately, so uh, we can take on even more work. I'll take a quick detour when we're on the topic of both New York and apartment living. Man, it's no sidebars this week. No sidebars. Well, well this is uh, Jermaine. You know, New York State passed its budget this week, which included some sizable tax hikes, income tax hikes. And we're number one. We're number one. Yes, we're number one now, apparently, in, uh, when you combine city and state taxes. But one of the things on the table, which was, uh, thank goodness it didn't pass, uh, not that it would have impacted me, but it would have impacted the, the market and the economy enormously, was there was going to be a condo slash co-op tax on people that had second dwellings in New York, I guess office workers that you know, were staying often in New York often enough to to buy a place and use it as a, as a second dwelling. The proposal had been to tax the value that was north of $300,000 at somewhere between 10 and 13%. So just so to it's put the it, value of, of all the square footage after the first five square feet when you walk into the apartment. Well, pretty much. You know, in New York, for those that are not from New York, a, a million dollars in New York might get you slightly above average studio apartment, I guess right? In this, maybe not in this market, maybe it's better now, but you're not getting a lot for your money. You, I mean, you're not getting anywhere. You're not getting anything. You're getting a parking space for $300,000 in Manhattan, right? You're not getting a place to live, right? So let's suppose you, you had a studio apartment that you bought for a million dollars. That means $700,000 of this would have been taxable at 10%. That's $70,000, which the owner of that property is paying that twice, right? They're paying it once when they write the check to the government, and then when they go to sell their place, because the next guy knows he's got to pay the tax too, the value is not a million dollars anymore, right? The million, the, the value is now 900,000. This would have been an absolutely devastating turn of events for property owners in New York, right? Condo owners, co-op owners. And as it is, it's probably, would, it probably would have been the final nail in the coffin for that 57th street corridor, right? Billionaires row where you have the hundred story buildings, Apartments going for 25, 50, 75 million dollars, right? You throw another 10% tax on that thing. Demand is already lackluster even before COVID, right? I, th I think you put the final nail in the coffin on those developments and, and they sit 60% empty for the next decade. So looking at lodging, the lodging sector delinquency rate dropped to 15.95% in March. And our recent hotel report from our own analyst, Max Nelson, highlights some of the details behind the numbers. Joe. Yeah, so just to give a, a little bit of context, looking back to March 2020, uh, the special servicing uh, rate and delinquency rate were both decently below 5% in the lodging space. It shot, both of those numbers kind of shot up to the 20 to 25 percent range for special servicing and then kind of 24 now down to about 15 percent in terms of delinquency we've got about just under 15 billion in total 
outstanding lodging delinquent loans and just over 20 billion uh, in special servicing. I think one of the stories here is again, kind of regional, looking at the top uh, 10 or so MSAs here in terms of uh, delinquency rates or in terms of balance, I should say. Uh, we've got New York with a delinquency rate of 47%, Chicago 56%, Houston, which was a big problem pre-COVID and just continues to, uh, to get hurt on the hotel space, 73%. And a couple of others here, Portland, I think we talked about a big hotel there, which was in the middle of the uh, protests all summer, 77% uh, delinquency. And, but then, you know, you look at places like Miami, 8%. I mean, LA is not terrible at 15%, but, you know, just, it's a stark contrast when you're looking at some of these uh, different areas. And there's another piece here, which is about appraisal reductions. We had about 400 million in ARAs, uh, which are appraisal reduction amounts, which is, that was pre-COVID. Uh, now we're up to around 1.4 billion. So we've added a billion dollars in, let's call it special service or expected loss in this space during COVID. We just released it. So go check it out on our website. And on the topic of special servicing, we had a detailed report by one of our other analysts, Catherine Liu, and it walked us through what was going on across different property types last month. Yeah, so here's another one and stay with me. Uh, apologies if I drone on. I was actually in a meeting earlier today uh, for work and they asked me for an update on something and I, and I started and then I stopped and everyone was uh, giving me guff for going on too long. And it really hurt me to my core because if there's anyone in this company who appreciates a quick meeting with no nonsense, it's me. So I just, for anyone who was on that meeting, who may be listening, uh, I apologize and it'll never happen again, but I digress. Uh, apologies for that sidebar. Yeah. So the problem that we're looking at is, or the, the kind of data issue that we're looking at here is, you know, we've seen this headline special servicing rate, you know, starting since March or April of last year, and it's been relatively flat. It's been decreasing slightly here and there, but the question I raised in the podcast last week kind of is how many of those loans are just staying in special servicing versus how much of this is actually just, you know, some loans moving out and some loans moving in. So just, I'll give you a couple highlights because I don't want to bore everybody to tears, but if we look at uh, loans that were transferred to special servicing uh, during the pandemic, which is on or after March, 2020, 76 or 77 percent of them are still in special servicing as of March. Uh, 22 percent of them have fallen out and uh, only two percent of them have paid off. So what that tells me is that there's a good 24, 23 percent of that universe that is kind of that has been kind of moving in and out of the picture, right? So interesting thing is the the tiny amount that has been paid off. So what that tells me is there's still a lot of row to hoe, a lot of wood to chop in this market. And uh, maybe if I was one of these uh, CRE, CLO originators a little farther out on the risk spectrum, I might start looking at this list here because I'm sure a lot of these are coming up for maturity if they haven't already. So one interesting thing I actually came across my desk today was a, a listing from uh, a broker in the market, uh, JLL, that's offering for sale a six property portfolio of notes backed by 79 million in non-performing loan balance. You know, you have to go through and, and sign the confi and all that stuff for, for all the you know, nitty gritty details, but it's a thousand keys in five different states. I think the highlight of it is these loans are 60 and 90 days delinquent. So the servicer here is saying, is kind of putting it out there saying, you know what, I don't wanna carry this thing through, or at least testing the market and saying, I don't wanna carry this thing through. I don't wanna go foreclosure or REO. Anybody out there just want the note and then you deal with it. And the, and the trust will take whatever amount of loss they occurs after you know the discounted price on the sale. That kind of aligns with a little bit of the narrative that we were talking about last week, which is that that distressed log jam is kind of loosening up a little bit. So 
Uh, I saw that same email come through too, Dar Darren. I feel like I see kind of one or two of those a day now from different you know, brokers in the market. And I think it was last week we talked about how there was 20 or so uh, hotels coming up to auction on 10X. And I think a bunch of them are actually in CMBS. So, you know, I don't, I can't get in the servicers heads, but maybe one piece of this is that they're actually looking out and seeing now that the vaccines are rolling out, we got 20%. Now that, you know, reopenings are starting to happen and all that, they might be able to kind of jumps. They don't have to wait six months to take advantage of the recovery or they're running out of uh, time and patience on these things and they want to get, get rid of them. I don't know. And they're also seeing the same you know, headlines everyone else is, which is there's hundreds of billions of dollars of, of capital that's been raised and sitting on the sidelines waiting for distressed purchases. Feed the beast to right. a certain extent. Right. Yeah. It, it's the killer for the IO guy though, right? That's the worst of all worlds that you see a note get that sold for 97 cents on the dollar. So a de minimis loss to the trust but it could eat away, you know, eight years of income for you if it was a 10-year loan that gets sold off after two years, right? No uh, defeasance charge, right? Or defeasing of the loan, no prepayment premium or yield maintenance and so forth. So we've talked about that in the past. And if you're an IO holder, if this becomes, uh, you know, less anecdotal and more of a tidal wave, right? You're probably not getting enough uh, compensation for your IO if this becomes a real trend that grows. We'll have to turn that into a true educational segment next time. Turning to retail, we saw a number of different stories, Manus. Yeah, there were a lot of stories out there this week, and I'll, I'll try to tie them together at, at the end. UBS put out a, a piece this week which said that 80,000 stores would close by 2026. So that's uh, obviously, if you could do the math, another 16,000 a year, which is an awful lot of stores still to go. You know, I had gotten the feeling lately, probably in the last six months, that we, believe it or not, we had gotten over peak bankruptcy, peak store closing, and, and so forth, right? We've, we've squeezed Sears completely out of the system, right? We're down to fewer than 60 Sears now at this point, right? A lot of the over-levered retailers have gone bankruptcy and liquidated. Um, I, I think if you're still standing at this point, right, you've probably really trimmed the amount of real estate you have, and you probably have enough liquidity to keep going, because otherwise you probably would have uh, restructured by now or liquidated it, you know, if you were in such dire straits. So for somebody to come out and say, we have 80,000 more to go, uh, as UBS did, you know, that's a little jolting, right? You know, I, I, I was hoping that the light was at the end of the tunnel in terms of our resizing, but apparently UBS feels otherwise. Um, Moody's put out a piece which showed another modest decline in mall occupancy. They follow a set of, I think, about 50 malls that they set up a benchmark for. I, I think their occupancy fell by another 1% or 2%, which is not surprising, right? We're seeing more and more store closings. You know, two negative stories on, on retail. And, you know, what is the market telling us? We, we've mentioned many times over the year that we've been doing this podcast that where rubber meets the road is in CMBX 6, triple B minus bets. CMBX is a derivative. CMBX 6 has the most mall exposure. Triple B minus is the place where you have, um, other than the double B, which doesn't get traded all that much, it has the least credit enhancement. So if you believe that malls are going to default in droves, like uh, Carl Icahn did, and Katie McGee and Dan McNamara, right? You went short and you've made a lot of money already. And if you're long, if you bet the malls were going to muddle through, you took the long position and on paper, or maybe you've closed it out, you know, you, you've taken big losses. But at the beginning of the year, the spread on CMBX 6, triple B minus was about 2250. So 2250 basis points as of December 31. 2020. This is as of market, by the way, market partners. Um, as of today, 2,640, right? So we've seen almost 400 basis points in widening. So what the market is telling you is that they are not buying any narrative that says this reopening of the U.S. economy is going to be a source of resilience for malls, right? People are not making that bet. If people were making that bet, you would have seen this tighten three or 400 basis points, but instead 
even with a vaccine, even with good economic numbers, even with states opening 400 basis points wider over the last four months, three and a half months. So I got to give a shout out to my boy, Sean B. He's actually a good friend of mine who does not live in this space. But when I went to meet up with him, he said, so can you explain CMBX to me? Because he's been listening to the podcast. So I got to give him that. I got to give him that shout out. I don't know if he ex understands it anymore now after my explanation or after that explanation, but uh, just made me think of that. I got to give him a shout out. Nothing better than a, an award-winning listener who has nothing to do with this market, who's just listening for me, Coach, and Manis, oh, me, Martha, and Manis, Oops, you know, you shoot, there. shooting the bull, you know? Well, I always say, think of CMBX like it was, you know, a casino offering odds on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 18 months ago to win the Super Bowl, right? They were offering their 40 or 50 or 60 to one. And they said, you know, every guy from Florida is going to walk in here, he's going to drop a thousand bucks, thinking that this is their year or whatever. And we'll collect this all day and night. And then one day they, they signed Tom Brady. And all of a sudden those odds dropped to, you know, eight to one from 40 right. or 50 to one. And the casinos are thinking, how do I slough off this risk? I never expected in a million years to have to pay any of these guys. And the guy who bought, you know, the long, basically bought the bucks at 40 to one, could have sold that piece of paper, right, with a big profit even before they won the Super Bowl. So it's kind of one way to think about these derivatives. Shout I did out to Johnny G there. <laughs> Johnny G, our colleague who had that bet. He did do that bet, yes. I'll do one more meandering on the retail space. Did you guys see that high school in Burlington, Vermont, had to use an empty Macy's for their high school after the actual high school itself was found to be covered in toxic chemicals or contaminated, I guess, with toxic chemicals. So they've taken 150,000 square feet in a, in a former Macy's in Burlington, Vermont, full with escalators, working escalators and, and the whole thing. I don't know if the mannequins are still there. And I think they're going to put three and a half million dollars into this thing to make it more school-like. So replacing the Aunt Annie's with the terrible food and, you know, uh, putting in some, some alarms where there used to be uh, kind of Muzak music. <laughs> I could only, like, the amount of hijinks that oh, could be bad. I was into in, in my high school years in a fairly strict school environment, like, if we were let loose in a mall... Like that, it just sounds It's a Macy's. Ridiculous. How much trouble could you get into? You know, just the escalators alone. I would have gotten like 150 demerits just messing with those. <laughs> Pushing that button to stop it. Yeah, we used to do that in the, in the mall. You kick it, you kick right under where the, the little handrail thing goes in. If you kick it hard enough, the whole thing stops. And then you run away. I mean, what else can you do when you're 13 years old? We digress. Okay, deals of the week, Manus. Uh, I have a couple of deals of the week. The first one has to do with a selling of a retailer's headquarters. This comes by way of Real Estate Business Online, I should point out. They, they are the writers of this piece. BPM Real Estate Group acquired PetSmart's corporate headquarters in Phoenix for $110 million. Our data shows the lease to PetSmart ending in 2023, but I can't imagine somebody's buying this thing without that lease having been extended for a considerable period of time. It's located in Phoenix's Deer Valley submarket, uh, covers about 365,000 square feet. The property backs a 2013 uh, loan, which I guess at this point will either be defeased or, or, or paid off in the near term. I think it was close to its maturity date. Barry Gable, Chris Marchilden, and Will Mast of CBRE, along with Kevin Shannon, Ken White, and C.J. Osbrink of Newmark represented the seller, who was an institutional seller but was undisclosed. Um, and Newmark's Nick Kucha represented the buyer. And uh, David Millstone and Ramsey Daya, also of Newmark, uh, they arranged the financing for the acquiring entity, BPM. So uh, congratulations there. You know, you're never sure what kind of demand is going to be for any kind of retailer, although somebody like PetSmart not your traditional guy, right? It's a good mix of bricks and mortar and online stuff. And, and certainly everybody loves their pets and, and selling pet food is uh, going to outlast us all. 
Yeah, well, there's like a million more people with dogs or cats after the pandemic, right? Wasn't there some crazy stat out that there were like tons and tons of people who bought dogs at this point? So maybe long Petco, long, uh, long PetSmart or whatever is the right play if it's not too late or Chewy. So I'll give you one more deal of the week. This is also, I believe, from uh, yeah, Real Estate Business Online. The Redstone Group acquired the lodges at Glenwood. Uh, that's near Brigham Young University in Utah. It's an 1,100-bed student housing complex. Brian Eisendrath and Cameron Chalfant, Chalfant of CBRE secured the financing. Why did I pick this one? You know, the, the reason I picked the first one, anytime, you know, you see something unusual, which is like a, a retailer's headquarters purchase, that's interesting to me. And we've talked a lot about uh, the problems or the potential problems that student housing facilities may have had in the pandemic. It turns out that that was a narrative that never really played out. Student housing held up pretty well, uh, even in the pandemic. And, and so I wanted to point this out that not only did they hold up well, but uh, transactions are taking place where uh, student housing facilities are being acquired in this case by uh, Redstone. And turning to shout outs, we have a number of those. Nick C was interested in the Don Sheets. I think we should get a referral from Don for all of these that we kick over. We must him. have given him like a hundred people for his a newsletter. Ton. Uh, David D gave us some critical feedback. Mark S, Will S, Victor W, John M, Scott Berry posted on LinkedIn some of our content and so did Amrit Gill. Thank you for doing that. And you know, guys, this past year, we've talked about shortages of PPE, paper towels, toilet paper, semiconductors, and now it seems ketchup packets are a scarce commodity. So with all that takeout, I guess people are grabbing the packets to go and there's not a whole lot to go around, but Heinz says they're going to step up the supply. I don't know if you remember this urban legend. Maybe it wasn't urban legend. Maybe it was, you know, really true was that, you know, diners would buy one thing of Heinz ketchup <laughs> and then always replace it with the cheap stuff. Right, they get a form into the it. old glass Heinz. Right, because they wanted the imprimatur of, of serving a high end ketchup, but they didn't want the expense of doing it. And that led, you know, my buddies in high school to wonder if if the ketchup at the bottom never really got out. Right. <laughs> if if you know it was just that, you know, one inch of Heinz ketchup at the bottom that was there from nineteen forty four, you know, when the old horror movies were on and people would go to the diner woods diners after going to the drive in movie. You know, is that the same ketchup now that was there? Uh, Did they you know, uh, do carbon when, dating of the ketchup at the bottom of the bottle? Back when FDR was president? I think that's actually along the lines of where the cliche bottom of the barrel comes from. Is it? That's I think true. Yes, that's it true. Is. I will. I, I only have one uh, ketchup anecdote, and that is that, you know, my wife is a fairly uh, healthy person. You know, she likes all the organic, uh, you know, green nonsense. And... Uh, my two-year-old son, she once gave, you know, like the organic ketchup and he just looked at her like, are you kidding me? So I had to go get the Heinz in the fridge and I, I poured, I got that on his plate and he gave, he gave me that look like, you know me, dad, you know me. So that's, that is my, definitely my son. And with that, we'll close. Thank you, Darren, for daring to show up here this week. Hope it was worthwhile. And thanks to our producer, Haley Keen. Join us next week as we review what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, a comment, or a critique, send us an email at podcast at trip.com. For more info, visit trip.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you as always for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs> <laughs>